Well, welcome everyone to our third session in our study of the story of Jesus. And actually tonight we probably come to uh, one of the best known uh, uh, parts of the story, uh, at least a part of which I think many people uh, think they know about. Uh, and that is that we're going to look at the birth of Christ tonight. And of course, we're just about, uh, I guess, a little over a, uh, a month after uh, Christmas. And I'm glad, as I've said before, that we waited till now to, uh, to look at this, because actually, I think the image that most of us have of uh, that event uh, is actually not exactly what the Bible uh, says. And so we're going to see some things tonight that uh, probably are a little bit different. I don't think I'll ruin your Christmas, but uh, perhaps next year uh, when uh, Christmas rolls around, you'll be thinking about some of what we talked about tonight. Also, I want to thank you for your feedback. As a matter of fact, as many of you as can that can kind of give me feedback that things are going okay uh, or anything that we need to be thinking about changing, uh, just uh, let me know. Also, if you are on uh, Facebook and are getting your information, we've had sometimes a little bit of trouble with Facebook actually uh, communicating what needs to get communicated. I am sending out a uh, email every week that gives the link uh, up to uh, the live stream and that same link then is the link that will get you to the video. So if you would like to get on that list, uh, send me an email or respond to me on Facebook uh, with your email and uh, we'll get you on that, that other list. Uh, also, I know I make mistakes. Uh, I think it's inevitable, uh, particularly when you're uh, you know, going live like this. And uh, if, if you catch a mistake, feel free to, uh, again, send me a, a text or an email. I know that uh, uh, my uh, sister-in-law, Jan, uh, sent, when I talked with her last week, had picked up on a couple of things, uh, not only misspellings in my uh, visual slides, but also every once in a while you kind of stumble and say the wrong thing. I think I referred to uh, Jacob as Joseph at one point in time. So anyway, uh, yeah, give me a little bit of grace as we uh, go through this story. Uh, Last time, let me just uh, set a little bit of a context for uh, tonight. And again, uh, we're going to be, uh, as we said earlier, we're going to actually be looking at uh, the birth of Jesus uh, this week. Last time we met uh, some people. We met Zechariah and Elizabeth. And of course, uh, Zechariah uh, is the father of John the Baptist. And we learned that uh, John would have been a cousin of Jesus, and uh, he gets an announcement from Gabriel uh, that, that he, he and his elderly wife, we're told they're quite old, are going to have a uh, baby, and they're going to name him John. Uh, we also, of course, met Miriam, which in our English Bibles seems to always be translated as Mary. And Mary had a visit, of course, from the angel Gabriel, who uh, gave her an announcement that uh, was uh, mind-boggling, to say the least, uh, that she, as a young virgin, was going to conceive and have a child. Uh, and uh, that child, of course, uh, would be Jesus. And uh, she asked the question, well, how can that be? I'm a virgin. And uh, the angel proceeded to uh, tell her how she was going to be uh, uh, overshadowed by the power of God and that the Holy Spirit was miraculously uh, going to uh, fertilize an egg and that uh, there would be a baby boy born. Uh, we learned a little bit about Joseph and uh, Joseph of course is a character that we don't really uh, get a lot of information about in the Bible and we had to switch over to Matthew just to get a very uh, little peek at the fact that Matthew when he uh, excuse me, Joseph, when he discovers that Mary's pregnant, um, is going to uh, try to uh, divorce her kind of secretly. Uh, and again, engagement was almost like marriage. 
uh, it was uh, a very serious uh, commitment. And in a dream, he's told by an angel uh, a little bit about the fact that the baby that's been conceived has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. So really some of the main characters uh, that appear at this point in the story, and of course this is the very early life of Jesus, actually the beginning of the early life of Jesus, we've done some preliminary work. And so uh, I'm excited that today we finally get to the actual birth of Jesus. So we're going to fast forward a little bit uh, tonight, about nine months, and we're going to look at uh, what you might call uh, the real Christmas. And so again, we have uh, Joseph and Mary, uh, married now, by the way. Uh, Joseph has taken Mary into his home, uh, but the marriage has not been consummated. And again, if you uh, happen to have a Catholic background, um, you might believe uh, in what's called the perpetual virginity of Mary, that that marriage was never actually physically uh, consummated, but uh, Joseph has taken Mary home, so they're married, and uh, they're living uh, in Nazareth, and Mary, uh, at this point in time, is pregnant. Uh, by the way, we, we don't know exactly how pregnant Mary is, which is one of the things that we'll be looking at a little bit tonight, because our image at this point in time is of a, you know, a, a woman that is uh, on the verge of uh, giving childbirth, uh, riding a donkey, you know, some 90 miles uh, to get to Bethlehem, and we'll We'll see what the text actually says about that tonight. Uh, the story of the birth, as it's recorded again uh, in Luke, begins with a, uh, a decree. And in the second chapter of Luke, we read this. In those days, uh, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while or before Quirinius was governor of Syria. I've added the before, by the way, it's not in your text, but uh, I'll show you why in a few minutes. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. A couple of things to point out. Uh, this decree is, uh, first of all, issued by Caesar Augustus. Uh, this is Octavian. He was the emperor of the Roman Empire from roughly 27 BC to 14 AD. And uh, we also read and see a little bit about a, uh, the governor of Syria named Quirinius. We uh, find out that the hometown of David is Beth, excuse me, the place where Joseph needs to go is to the hometown of David, uh, which was Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was uh, located uh, just about five miles south of Jerusalem. And so what we're going to see here uh, is that as he goes there, as Joseph goes with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and again was expecting a child. We know she's pregnant. We just don't know how much. So uh, we're here at Nazareth, which is up in the region of Galilee. We looked a little bit at that uh, last time. And uh, we need to get down here to Bethlehem. And so we have a journey. Um, different uh, uh, resources will give you different mileage, but uh, roughly around 90 miles. And part of what would have happened there, and you don't see it with the straight arrow, is that uh, when we get to John chapter 4 uh, and we talk about Jesus going through Samaria, this was something the Jews didn't do at this point in time. And so if you were in Galilee, what you really would do is you would move over to the Jordan Valley and you would go down the Jordan Valley uh, to get uh, parallel to Jerusalem usually. And then you would cross over 
uh, into Judea so that you would uh, not have to go through Samaria. So that was probably the route that was uh, taken. Uh, one of the things you normally see in the Christmas story is that uh, I think you normally see uh, Joseph and uh, Mary uh, kind of isolated. Uh, you see uh, Mary very pregnant, usually on a donkey, and uh, uh, Joseph leading that donkey. This is probably not accurate. So let me begin to deconstruct your image of Christmas for you. Uh, in all probability, given the circumstances, Joseph and Mary would have been part of a caravan. Uh, nowhere in the Bible does it say that she was riding a donkey. And so again, that just has become part of folklore uh, surrounding Christmas. Uh, depending on how pregnant she was, I'd say there's a high probability that uh, maybe she rode in a cart. Uh, it would have been pretty tough riding a donkey being pregnant. Some uh, scholars actually think that much like most of the people that perhaps she even walked, but given the fact that she was pregnant, um, you know, in my mind, and again, speculatively, I think maybe something like a, a, a cart, uh, possibly was a donkey, but the Bible doesn't say that. Uh, we don't really know how pregnant she was uh, again. Um, normally, again, when you uh, see a, a picture of, or in your mind, imagine uh, the birth of Christ, you, you sort of think of them, uh, Mary being nine months pregnant, uh, in labor, uh, arriving on a donkey in Bethlehem, Joseph frantically uh, trying to find a place to stay, and just in the nick of time uh, being allowed to use uh, basically a barn and Jesus uh, being born uh, that night. And none of that is actually what the Bible says. <laughs> we will again uh, take a look at uh, what the text says. Uh, it's funny because uh, I know that many of you know I worked on the Bible series that was on the History Channel, and the writers, uh, along with all of that, and the sort of the frantic emotion of Joseph trying to uh, find a place to stay, I think we added a rainstorm on top of it so that it was you know, very, very high uh, drama. But again, uh, in the Bible, uh, there is no donkey. Uh, she is not in labor when they arrive in Bethlehem, and it's uh, certainly not uh, December 25th. Uh, let, let me make a couple of comments again to set a, a broader uh, kind of a context to what's getting ready to happen. Uh, before the story began, God already had a plan, and uh, that plan was that he would, and this is the way that C.S. Lewis described it, that because he is God, that he would create the most perfect uh, universe possible uh, that he had to uh, by virtue of the fact that he was God. And to that end, we know that he created uh, intelligent beings, uh, we call them humans, made in his image, uh, with the capacity to relate to him in a love relationship, which uh, is oftentimes uh, uh, what the answer is to the question, you know, what's the purpose of life? Well, it's to uh, live in a love relationship with God and with each other. Well, to that end, uh, he would give these beings, uh, both human and angelic, by the way, uh, freedom to reject him. And uh, since God is omniscient, meaning that he knows the future, uh, he did that knowing, uh, obviously, that they would reject him. But he had a plan to use even this rebellion uh, to ultimately create a universe more perfect 
than one in which uh, rebellion and redemption had never occurred. And this is to tie in to what we look at tonight. The, the centerpiece of that plan would require him personally to invade human history and take on human flesh. And that happens through what we call the incarnation of the Son. And through 2,000 some years of Jewish history, through the writings of the law and the prophets, uh, God revealed how and when and where that was to take place, and we'll see all of that tonight. We, we're watching as we go through this text, these texts tonight, we're really watching all of that unfold. And it begins with a census. Uh, God uses the process of human history to get a pregnant Mary to Bethlehem. And of course, they need to be in Bethlehem. We, we've talked a little bit about it before, but again, uh, the scripture prophesied uh, hundreds of years before the birth of Christ that uh, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, Caesar Augustus that issues the decree was the, the great nephew of Julius Caesar. Um, as I said before, he began to rule the Roman Empire around 27 BC. And uh, here's sort of the deal. Uh, empires cost a lot to run. And the primary way of funding the Roman Empire uh, was through conquest and taxation. And a census was simply a vehicle of taxation. And so uh, Joseph and Mary are going to Bethlehem, uh, not simply to be recorded, uh, which would have happened in just like a normal census takes place, but the real objective is that uh, they are going to Bethlehem uh, to pay taxes. And so uh, this was being done in uh, various provinces of the Roman Empire all the time. Uh, 700 years prior to this event, before there was a Roman Empire again, the Jewish prophet Micah. Uh, prophesied where God would invade human history. And in the same way that Isaiah had prophesied that a virgin uh, would be with child and give birth to a son, Micah identified the place of that birth as Bethlehem. And in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, uh, we read, But you, Bethlehem, Though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now, this was understood, actually, uh, among the Jewish community, or at least among scholars in the Jewish community, a little bit later, uh, we're going to see that Herod, uh, this won't be today, this will be uh, in our next session, but Herod is going to ask his advisors, uh, where is the Messiah to be born? And what they do is they will quote Micah to him. So you kind of think about this in a, maybe kind of a crazy perspective, but how, how do you get a young couple about to have the right baby in the wrong place, how do you get that couple to the right place? And kind of humorously perhaps, although maybe accurately, uh, what you do is you create the Roman Empire, of course. And at exactly the right moment, uh, you put it on the heart of the emperor that he needs more money to keep fighting wars and building amphitheaters. And this time, how about taxing those pesky Jews? And that will require Joseph and Mary to travel uh, the 91 miles with Mary pregnant to Joseph's ancestral home, Bethlehem, 
because he comes from the line of David, of course, fulfilling another prophecy that the coming Messiah would be a descendant of David, and it's there that their baby will be born. There's actually some debate about this decree, and let me tell you what it is. Uh, it might have been better had Luke not left the parenthetical phrase in the text that this was the first census while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, the problem is, is that historians tell us that Quirinius became the governor of Syria in 6 AD. We know that at the time of the birth of Jesus, also Herod is alive, and historians for many years, and there's been some change in this, uh, believe that Herod died in 4 BC. And uh, the debate now is that perhaps uh, because there was only one ancient text that apparently gave that date and that that, that might have gotten somehow uh, in the process of uh, translation, uh, that the numbers uh, became inaccurate so that some scholars now place Herod's death at 1 uh, BC or 1 AD. And by the way, from 1 BC to 1 AD is simply a year period. There is no, no zero in there. So um, uh, what we have, particularly if you think that Herod died in 4 BC and Quirinius was uh, not, didn't become the governor of Syria. And uh, by the way, the governor would have been like what Pontius Pilate was in Judea. So he was the governor over that whole area of, of Syria. But you have a, uh, an inconsistency or a gap here of 10 years, really, 4 BC, 6 AD. Uh, how, how does all of that fit together? Um, when we get to Luke chapter 3, and I think that this is uh, perhaps the most important statement in terms of timing and all this, we're told that Jesus was about, that's an interesting word that got thrown in the text, but he was about 30 in the 15th year of Tiberius. Now, Tiberius will be the Roman emperor um, after Octavian. And the 15th year of uh, Tiberius's reign would have been 29 uh, AD. And if, you, uh, if Jesus is 30 or about 30 in 29 AD, then it really pushes the birth uh, back right to what we commonly would think of as the beginning of the year of our Lord. Uh, Otherwise, A.D. is not really A.D. because if he was born earlier, and again, some scholars uh, place the birth of Christ as far back as 5 or 6 B.C., and uh, in which case, again, uh, A.D. wouldn't really be A.D. On the other hand, if in fact uh, there is some, simply some mistake uh, about the dating of Quirinius or the death of Herod, then A.D. might be A.D. Uh, also, you know, you, you might be aware of this, but uh, the concept of A.D. and B.C. was created by a, uh, a scholarly monk in Rome in the year 525 A.D. And uh, it, he actually was trying to help get a fixed date for Easter and uh, we don't know exactly how he came up with the, the uh, beginning of the year of our Lord. Uh, it, it could be that he looked at the text in Luke, which places it much closer to what we uh, today know as sort of the starting point of the year of our Lord. And uh, so, um, it's, again, one of those things we, we aren't exactly sure of, but it is interesting that it seems like scholarship is moving more uh, closely toward that actually, um, you know, here we are in the year 2022, 
that it would have been 2022 years ago when Jesus was born, which kicked off uh, the AD period. Of course, in the secular world now, uh, they don't like using that terminology uh, AD, year of our Lord BC, before Christ. And so now uh, you'll, you'll look at dates and it'll say uh, CE, which means the Christian era, uh, and uh, BCE, before the Christian era. And, but again, they, they would tend to use that uh, starting point that we, we currently use. The birth itself, uh, we're told this about that Joseph went there to register with Mary, a little bit more of the background, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the in. It's probably hard to imagine, but again, if all of the descendants of David that were there in the Holy Land all had to come to Bethlehem, uh, you could sort of imagine it was extremely crowded, little city. Uh, it probably was a little bit uh, uh, chaotic. And, uh, and people, there would have been a lot of people related to each other. Uh, we can imagine Joseph uh, going door to door, uh, a lot of people there that he would have been uh, related to. Uh, so um, you, you, know, you can again kind of picture that uh, being again, maybe not quite as frantic as we normally see, but at least trying to find a place to stay. Uh, and the other piece of that is that we're told that, that Jesus is born while they were there. In other words, it, it wasn't that they arrived and uh, immediately uh, Jesus is born. Mary was probably not in labor uh, at the time they arrive in Bethlehem, we don't know how long of a period it is from the time they arrive until the time that Jesus uh, was actually born. Uh, the other little phrase that uh, always kind of, I think is part of how we picture this is, is that we're, we're simply told that when the child is born, when Jesus is born, that Mary places him in a manger, which was a feeding trough, um, because there was no room at the inn, which can actually mean a couple of different things. Uh, there probably were inns uh, there in Bethlehem. They, they were full. But the word inn actually um, uh, can mean more than uh, a, the word that's used there, translated in, uh, can mean more than just like a holiday inn. Uh, the word actually uh, has to do with, uh, along with, it can be an inn, but it also had to do with the way that houses were built uh, in that period uh, of time. And the word literally uh, can simply mean a dwelling place. And sometimes it was a word that was uh, used to refer to the fact that houses uh, had two levels. And uh, the upper level was sort of, was the sleeping area uh, where the family would sleep at night. The lower level, uh, we think, contained the kitchen and where a lot of daily activity would go on. But at night, when the family would move upstairs to sleep, they would bring, if it was a, a cold night, they would bring the animals in and the animals would occupy that lower level. And so in some ways, when the text says she put the baby in a manger and that there was no room at the inn, it, it might simply mean that there were no guest quarters, which would have been upper level. And so consequently, 
uh, they end up staying in the lower level, which again, during the night, uh, some animals would have been brought in, but there would have been a feeding trough there, and the baby is put inside of a feeding trough. Now, for the last 1800 years, uh, that uh, was pictured in a little bit different way, and the traditional idea is that actually uh, that it wasn't speaking uh, of the guest quarters, although fascinatingly, uh, the New International Version actually translates it, there was no room in the guest quarters. But traditionally, um, the birth took place outside of a house in what was called a grotto. And a grotto was simply uh, a cave that was used to keep animals in at night. Uh, this happens to be uh, one of the locations uh, uh, that if you go to, uh, to Israel, um, you go to what's called the Church of the Nativity, and uh, the Church of the Nativity is, uh, was built over the spot where we um, tradition believes Jesus was born. Uh, the idea of the grotto apparently really goes back quite far uh, to uh, around 200 BC. Um, Clement of Alexandria talked about the grotto. One of the things that happened was that when this had been identified as the birthplace of Jesus, when Hadrian uh, became the emperor of Rome, he actually built a pagan temple over the spot because he was trying to eradicate Christianity, and he was really trying to uh, inculcate Greek and Roman culture uh, into uh, the foreign lands that Rome had conquered. Um, when you go to the Church of the Nativity, which by the way is in Palestinian territory, Bethlehem is in Palestinian territory, and if you go there uh, as a tourist, for instance, you have to cross over uh, and if you're on a tour bus, uh, oftentimes a Palestinian uh, soldier will come on aboard the bus and check to make sure that you look okay. Uh, but clear down at the far end in this picture, you see a very little tiny opening. And when you go inside of there, uh, you, you come into an area. And uh, on this picture, if you look at the very back of the crowd, you'll see a head uh, standing up and looking back at the crowd. Uh, I actually took this picture. This is our group was there and the group that you see was the group right in front of us. It wasn't our folks that were dressed like this, but they would let you come uh, through uh, in groups a certain number at a time. And behind him is actually an opening or a door that then leads down to an area uh, where a shrine has been built and where tradition says that this shrine was built uh, over the grotto. Uh, and uh, you can see when you're there that there is a, uh, a star in the floor and an opening. And if you look down through the star, you will see the actual rock part of the grotto. And uh, uh, in, in the way that many things happen in the Holy Land, this star sp uh, supposedly is the exact site where Jesus was born. <clears throat> what happened is, is that when Constantine uh, uh, issued the Edict of Milan, which up until that point in time for, for a number of years, Christianity was illegal and being persecuted, Constantine and the Edict of Milan uh, made it uh, legal Christianity legal, it wasn't till later that it became the official religion of the empire, which in some ways was a disaster because then if you were a citizen of the Roman Empire, you were automatically considered to be a Christian, uh, whether you had ever had a heart encounter with God and opened your life to Christ or not. But um, Constantine's mom, uh, Helena, uh, was a believer and after uh, Constantine had made uh, Christianity 
legal in the empire, she took a trip to Jerusalem in 325 AD and uh, spent time uh, where people there in Jerusalem uh, or in Bethlehem would take her around to different sites and say, this is, you know, this is the site where Jesus was born. And so Helen would say, uh, let's build a church here. I, I, I guess they must have had to tear down uh, the temple that Hadrian built. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not. We know that in 70 AD, uh, Jerusalem was completely destroyed. Uh, if you read Josephus, Josephus says literally not one rock standing on top of another, uh, which has caused debate around, well, what about the Temple Mount? And there are a variety of answers to that. <clears throat> but uh, in uh, uh, 130, 125, 130 AD, uh, the Romans uh, decided to rebuild Jerusalem as a Roman city. And uh, it was rebuilt and it was called uh, uh, Aeolia Capitola. And, uh, and so there was a Roman city there with, you know, amphitheater, all the rest. Uh, and Temple Mount would have been there. Some actually believe that rather than the existing Temple Mount actually being the Temple Mount, that that's where the 10th Legion, which was assigned by the Romans to guard the city, that's, it's the exact dimensions of what a legion would have used to camp out. So, you know, there's a number of uh, kind of interesting um, dynamics here. But eventually, Helena began to have churches built over sites that were traditionally um, viewed as uh, the actual sites where certain things took place. The birth itself, uh, uh, takes place on what we would either refer to, depending on whether it was before or after midnight, probably after midnight to make it Christmas Day, all right, uh, takes place uh, in this fashion. Um, we're told, first of all, what we're told is, is that while they were there, uh, the time came. Not a lot of uh, detail about the actual birth, uh, you could kind of fill in the blanks. As a matter of fact, we could do a little imagi imagination here as we uh, move on. And again, speculative imagination, let's call it, since we already know that, that most of the images that we have of Christmas and pregnant Mary on the donkey and the frantic search for a place to stay, probably, that's not what the, the way the Bible pictures it. But uh, if you filled in the, bank, the blanks, Mary uh, here in this grotto uh, or in an upper or lower, excuse me, lower room of one of the homes, uh, you, you can imagine there was quite a bit of activity going on. Um, we tend to sort of sanitize and spiritualize these kind of events, but you, many of you know what it's like uh, to have a baby. Uh, and in those days, it was much more complex, uh, obviously, and there wasn't a hospital. But there probably were midwives. Uh, again, they, they might have been relatives since almost everyone in Bethlehem at that point in time would have been a descendant of David. And so uh, there would have been midwives, preparations put in place. Uh, you can almost imagine Joseph sort of perhaps anxiously paying pacing back and forth outside the uh, grotto. And then imagine that, you know, we hear maybe one of the midwives kind of yelling out loudly, now push! And uh, Mary cries out and with one final big push, we hear a baby utter its first cry. Um, you know, when we sing songs at Christmas time. One of the songs we sing is Away in the Manger. It's a it's a it's a sweet little, you know, Christmas hymn. But but one of the lines it's just can't it's just not accurate, you know. Uh the you know when the the cattle are lowing uh uh and the the little Lord Jesus, no crying 
he makes. In other words, like, you know, Jesus was, was such a holy baby that he, he didn't cry. And, and I can promise you that's probably not accurate. And uh, certainly at the moment of birth, uh, we probably would have heard the little baby cry. Joseph rushes in. Uh, we're told Mary wraps the baby in swaddling clothes. Um, and in the text, it, uh, it says that, you know, she wraps the baby in swaddling clothes. In the text, it says she places the baby in a manger. Uh, in some ways, you kind of wonder if she isn't so bushed that she, you know, hands the baby over to a midwife, but we better go with what the text says again. But in the most unlikely and simplistic of places and events, God invades human history. And again, theologians refer to it as the incarnation. And John simply made the statement uh, in our first session together that the Word becomes flesh. The Son of God, uh, existing from all eternity, takes on a human body and yet remains fully God while being fully human, uh, two natures in one person. And ironically, uh, the church will spend the next 300 years uh, debating exactly what does that mean? two natures, one person, uh, until the Council of Nicaea, where uh, uh, now the, you know, the church has, uh, you know, has really become more part of the Roman Empire, and Constantine calls together bishops uh, from all over uh, the Roman Empire to come to this town of Nicaea in modern-day Turkey, and, uh, and there, uh, the bishops together make a number of decisions in including uh, the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. A, a couple of thoughts about Christmas, by the way, uh, because, of course, this is um, the moment we celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus. Uh, although, tragically, I, I imagine if you were on the streets today and simply, you know, pulled over, maybe even a teenager, uh, certainly a younger child, and, and were to ask them, you know, what, what's Christmas all about? And we've just celebrated it. Um, I think you would find that for many younger people, uh, the answer to that might not have much to do with Jesus. It might more have to do with Santa Claus and presents and, and Christmas trees, but, but the, the real uh, true meaning of Christmas uh, has kind of been lost. But Christmas has a very interesting uh, history. As a matter of fact, it was not officially celebrated even within the church for over 300 years. And there were reasons for that. The main one being that that no one uh, really knew the date when Jesus was born. It certainly wasn't December 25th. And um, as a two of the Gospels uh, completely leave the birth narrative out. And uh, Matthew only has, I think, one paragraph about it. So it's really the Gospel of, of Luke that gives us uh, more of the details. The first official celebration of Christmas took place on December 25th, 336 AD. And uh, one of the um, debates is why was December 25th picked? This was, uh, December 25th was the date when the Romans uh, celebrated the, uh, the, the winter solstice. It, it was a big pagan event. Um, the birth of the sun, uh, Sol Evictus, the Invictus, the actual sun, it was uh, like 
the rebirth of the sun being celebrated because now, uh, you know, the days had consistently, sunlight had gotten shorter and shorter and shorter, and uh, now uh, that's going to change and days will begin to get longer, and it was a big pagan celebration. The two kind of de um, different ideas that get debated, um, one is that uh, it was uh, simply that, that Christians sort of uh, merged into that pagan celebration, and uh, it was uh, apparently quite wild, uh, the, the pagan celebration. The other is that that it was as if the church decided, um, well, it, we don't want our people taking part in that, so why not uh, have a celebration that's on that, that same date uh, to uh, not, sim not simply compete, but to provide an alternative, and therefore December 25th uh, was picked as that date. Uh, the actual date of the birth of Christ, we aren't exactly sure, but it probably ties into the fact uh, that we're going to look at in a minute that there were shepherds uh, in their fields at night. And uh, in 200 AD, Clement of Alexandria, one of the great scholars of the early church, um, he had somehow calculated that the birth was uh, took place probably on March 20th or April 20th, but the celebration within the church uh, didn't take place until uh, 336 BC. Um, I was also thinking a little bit about our, uh, our concept of uh, St. Nicholas, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, but this is an, an icon of St. Nicholas. Uh, there was really a St. Nicholas. Uh, he was the bishop of uh, the city of Myra, and Myra was on the coast of uh, southern uh, Asia Minor, or what is uh, now known as uh, Turkey. And uh, he, he kind of ties in, ultimately, uh, to what we're going to look at in terms of, again, the kind of evolution of the concept of St. Nicholas. Uh, so, uh, Christmas, the celebration, historians tell us, really wasn't that big of a deal. And initially, it was called the Feast of the Nativity, all right? And uh, it really wasn't that big of a deal until around the ninth century, uh, it started to build some momentum. And the celebration, the name of it was changed, uh, from the Feast of the Nativity to Christ's Mass uh, in the year 1038. And of course, what happened was Christ's Mass sort of got, you know, pushed together and abbreviated and became Christmas. So that's really where our word Christmas came from. Um, at the time of the Reformation, there was uh, so much antagonism between Catholics and Protestants. The fact that this was Christ's Mass, uh, the Puritans uh, actually uh, made it illegal to celebrate Christmas because they said it was just a, a papal celebration. And, and some scholars believe that this event uh, even within the church has sort of become a, a time of uh, misbehavior and uh, drunkenness sometimes uh, when it was celebrated. And so um, in 1659, the Puritans outlawed the celebration of Christmas in the colonies. Now, not all of the colonies uh, were under the control of the Puritans, but it, just that idea, and, and it was illegal until I believe it was 1681 in the colonies, even though uh, that it was an earlier date that it, that it, that it began to be celebrated uh, in Europe. Um, it really wasn't until the 1800s that Christmas began to become a big deal. 
And there were some reasons for that. One was that uh, Charles Dickens uh, wrote his book, A Christmas Carol, and, uh, uh, you know, portrayed it as sort of this, you know, festive time, you know, in between uh, the visitations that uh, Ebenezer Scrooge received. And then it was also a around this period of time that Clarence Moore wrote his famous short story, The Night Before Christmas. Um, musicians began to write Christmas hymns, but also secular songs about Christmas began to be written around this time. Uh, Deck the Halls uh, was written in 1784. Uh, Jingle Bells, 1857. And then in 1881, um, kind of a famous uh, illustrator named Thomas Nast uh, drew a picture of St. Nicholas. And uh, as a jolly fellow, uh, you know, uh, rather rotund, um, and in this particular, uh, you know, picture, uh, as we uh, continue to conceive, uh, kind of the big, you know, bushy white beard. Uh, actually, originally, Nast clothed him in tan and then green, so the red of St. Nicholas comes a little bit longer. Our image uh, of St. Nicholas uh, really uh, started in around 1930 when the Coca-Cola Company decided that they would do an advertisement in the Saturday Evening Post uh, about Christmas time. And so they portrayed St. Nicholas, much as Thomas Nast had, but instead of a pipe in his hand, he has a bottle of Coke. And uh, it was such a success uh, that every year at Christmas time, uh, Coke would have another uh, portrayal of St. Nicholas done uh, in his red suit holding a, uh, uh, a Coke. Uh, so the Coke replaced the pipe. Um, for most of Christian history, uh, Christmas uh, hasn't been celebrated like we celebrate it these days. And I would say that, uh, again, just doing a little research, that the commercialization of Christmas time, uh, well, it, it started back in the mid 1800s, like we've talked about as things began to ramp up a bit, but it really took off in the 1950s. So uh, most people, you know, today, unless they're, uh, you know, my age or older, uh, probably don't remember how simple Christmas was celebrated, but uh, the, the commercialization really took off around the 1950s. And then you look uh, at the insanity today of, uh, of what Christmas, uh, how Christmas is celebrated. And again, tragically, oftentimes celebrated without anything uh, connected to Jesus. But the most important point of this, by the way, you know, given all of that, you know, given the uh, images that might not be quite accurate or uh, aren't really what the biblical account says, the most important message is simply that Jesus was born, that God invaded human history, and that the Son of God became the Son of God man. Uh, by the way, you, uh, uh, you might notice a little bit later that there are no wise men involved at this point in time, and that's because that event actually took place later. We'll look at that next uh, week together uh, because we're going to look at the entire childhood of Jesus uh, next session. Simply, it, there's not much there, but we'll go through all of that. And the wise men actually uh, actually uh, come in at that point in time, uh, not at the nativity. Then we have the first announcement that's made. We're told this, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. So we have the fields outside of the village of Bethlehem. Shepherds at this point in history, uh, this was not a glorious job. Um, they were sort of on the bottom of the social totem pole, uh, just a notch above beggars and tax collectors oftentimes. Uh, their testimony was considered not reliable in court. And, uh, and yet, uh, here they are out uh, taking care of the sheep. And what, again, what scholars believe is the fact that they were in their fields at night taking care of their sheep was probably because this was lambing season. This was uh, the time of the year where lambs were being born. And quite possibly the shepherds that are referred to here and the sheep that are referred to here uh, because of the location might have actually been uh, sheep that were literally bred for sacrifice at the temple. And so it, there, there would be a kind of a synchronicity here that, that as the sheep that and lambs are being born that one day will be sacrificed at the temple that the true lamb of God is born there in Bethlehem and that the first announcement is made to the shepherds and while they're there you know this angel appears and and we're told uh, they were terrified and these were tough guys so I mean these were sort of Israeli cowboys and yet again, an angel appears probably in its glory and, uh, and they're terrified and they're given an announcement. Uh, this is actually modern outside Bethlehem, uh, modern day Israel, but not much has changed. So the idea of shepherds out in the fields would probably look something like this, okay? But here's the announcement, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And then suddenly uh, we're told that a great company uh, of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, uh, praising God and saying this, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. That's a more accurate translation than men of goodwill. And actually the idea here is that God's favor uh, is resting on people through the birth of his son and that God is going to be glorified and that men uh, on whom his favor rests will experience uh, his peace. And then suddenly, zap, you know, the angels are gone. And, and, and the shepherds, you gotta imagine, are looking at each other kind of like, what was that? And so we're told when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so the shepherds go, the shepherds arrive, uh, they see the baby, they, they, uh, they go back uh, to work glorifying and praising God. They, they probably have told uh, Mary and Joseph what has happened. Uh, and the word begins to spread. And then we're simply told that Mary treasured all these things in her heart and pondered them in her mind. Again, you'll notice no wise men here in this particular uh, reenactment, uh, which again will be part of our next session where we'll look at the major uh, biblical events of Jesus uh, as a child. So uh, thanks for uh, being with us tonight, or if you happen to be watching on video later, uh, it's great to be together. And again, feel free to contact me and uh, give me feedback uh, or get on that mailing list.
We'll see you next time.